Well, hello there, class. This is Professor Khan joining you again. Uh, today, I want to talk a little bit about character. So paper two is um, all about you writing an analysis of character and conflict in the uh, story that you chose for paper one, either Sonny's Blues or Paul's case. And in this paper, <clears throat> you are going to want to uh, employ certain terms and concepts to help you define the character and conflict uh, elements of fiction in those in that story. So this is the first of two presentations about those elements of fiction. This one's going to focus on character. And there'll be a second one that focuses on conflict. And both of these presentations are going to, uh, like I said, introduce you to certain terms and concepts that we're going to uh, expect you to use in paper two. Now we're going to follow up those two presentations with yet a third presentation uh, that's going to be all about the sort of the way that you're going to write about character and conflict in relation to the central idea. Ultimately, your job in paper two is to connect character and conflict to the story's central idea. Before we continue, I just want to remind you that in our Blackboard course, we have a built-in glossary. So uh, if you know we cover some terms in this slideshow and you're a little fuzzy on them, you don't necessarily need to jump back into this presentation in order to, to uh, investigate the, the definitions uh, of the term. You certainly are welcome to, and I urge you to you know watch this presentation and the others more than once. But we do have a built-in glossary. Uh, if you are in our course site, just uh, in the menu on the left-hand side, just look for the glossary link. And also, there's a glossary at the end of our textbook. Um, you can open up our digital textbook, or of course, if you have the print version, and just go to the back, and there's a glossary of terms back there. You know, any time that you have a question about uh, what a term means, or uh, how, uh, if you whether or not you're using it correctly, you know, just shoot me an email, and I'll be happy to to help you with that. So the first thing we'll talk about is characterization. <clears throat> characterization is when uh, an author, uh, through the narrator, reveals the nature of a character to us. That's simply what characterization means. And characterization can occur in a variety of different ways. I mean, if we <clears throat> if we assume that a short story is centered on the experiences of a main character, then, you know, I think it's safe to say that most everything in the story is working to characterize that character in some way. But there are some very obvious ways in which authors characterize. For instance, when we have a narrator providing exposition, Remember exposition. Exposition is simply when the narrator informs us about something. You know, exposition could be something as simple as telling us that, you know, the character is tall or the character is wearing a blue hat or, you know, something like this. Uh, physical descriptions of a character. Um, giving us backstory about the character, telling us a little bit about the character's history. Um, that can serve as characterization. When the story um, moves into, you know, rising action, of course, we see the main character acting. We see the main character doing things. And based on what that character does, that tells us a little bit about the nature of the character, tells us about the personality of the character, tells us about the character traits. Uh, it tells us a little bit about what's motivating the character to do certain things. When a character speaks, uh, dialogue with other characters or perhaps inner uh, monologue <laughs> uh, when a character is sort of talking or thinking to itself that can serve as characterization if we have a, a type of narrator that allows us into the thoughts and the feelings of a character 
and the narrator reveals those to us. Of course, those things can tell us about character. You know, just think about a, a, a character in a short story, you know, is a, is a fiction, of course, but it's, you know, a, a human being and real human beings. We, um, we display and communicate our natures, our personalities uh, by the things that we do, the things that we say, uh, the things that we feel, the things that we think. So this is true for characters in fiction as well. Uh, other characters that surround the main character can also serve to characterize uh, the way they react to what a, a main character does, the way characters act and react around each other, what they say or think or feel about other characters, of course, can tell us a little bit about the nature of a character. <clears throat> so those are all, I think, pretty straightforward ways that we learn about character. There are other maybe more subtle ways, including setting. And paper three is going to focus on setting. But for now, I'll say that setting uh, sort of helps to characterize. Um, I like to sometimes think of setting as being almost like, you know, an extra set of clothing that a character wears. I mean, think about what you wear. The clothing that you wear reflects your personality. It maybe reflects your, your current mood or your state of mind. Your clothing is a choice that you make. Well, settings can be a choice. You know, we, we place ourselves in certain settings and that choice of setting helps to characterize us. It helps to uh, make people understand what we're about and what we like or what we don't like. So setting can also work to characterize. There are many other ways. Well, let's start with the protagonist. So the main character of a story, a short story in particular, is known as the protagonist. The protagonist is the focus of the short story. So we are reading, you know, literary short stories. And as we've said before, there's only so much room, only so much time for things to get done. Right? These are short stories. These are not two hour movies. These are not uh, novels. You know, this is not a comic book series. Th those are all other genres of storytelling, but it's not the genre that we're studying. We're studying the literary short story. So there's only so much room, right? <clears throat> that means there's really only going to be one protagonist that we have to think about and that we that we have to, to, to write about. Uh, the short story centers itself around that protagonist and that protagonist's journey or arc um, that that tr trip that the character is going on, so to speak, in the story. There may be other characters. There probably will be, but only one is going to really rise to the top as being central to the events of the story. Again, in you know things like novels, movies, you might have multiple protagonists. Uh, I've been kind of rewatching uh, off and on the the Lord of the Rings movies, for instance. And in those movies, and certainly in the books they're based on, you have multiple protagonists with multiple story arcs. But again, in a short story, we, we really only have that one character. And it's also uh, noteworthy to say, I think, that this protagonist is usually going to um, raise some sympathy uh, in the reader. <clears throat> the reader is going to sympathize with the protagonist. The protagonist may not be, you know, a great person. Uh, I'm thinking, for instance, of Bub uh, in Cathedral. You know, I mean, the guy is just kind of a schlub. Um, he's got some some biases and uh, he's got some, you know, some ideas that, you know, aren't very enlightened. <clears throat> he's not outright mean or anything, uh, but he's also, you know, not really doing a lot of work to make himself a better person or uh, make things better in his relationships. You know, he's just kind of a he's just kind of a schlub. Um, and yet we sympathize with him. Uh, I think, you know, in in. Uh, Sonny's Blues and in Paul's case, you know, the main characters of those stories, we sympathize with them. They may not always have the most admirable traits, 
um, but there are things about them that we admire. And ultimately, we are hopefully caught up in their journey. We're, we're caught up in their situations and their conflicts, and we become interested in them and, and what they are going to do. So there's a measure of sympathy that protagonists tend to engender in readers. Well, of course, we have secondary characters in stories as well. So really, any character other than the protagonist, we can consider a secondary character. Now, one type of secondary character is what we call the antagonist. We have the protagonist and the antagonist. Um, the antagonist is a secondary character that is in conflict with the main character. Now, I think it's safe to say, <clears throat> unless uh, we're talking about some sort of highly experimental short story, and those exist, but I think by and large, in order to have a short story, you've got to have a protagonist. But you don't necessarily need an antagonist. Um, an antagonist is a character that the protagonist is in an external conflict with. And there are all kinds of stories out there where the main character is not in conflict with another character. Um, certainly not as, as a main conflict. So, you know, it, we don't we don't necessarily have an antagonist in every short story, but I think we definitely do have a protagonist in every short story. Um, in Cathedral, you know, Bub is the protagonist. He's the main character. Uh, the other two characters are secondary characters. We have the wife and we have Robert. Um, is the wife an antagonist to Bub? Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, Bub and the wife uh, don't have the greatest of relationships. Um, you know, there are many points throughout the story where the wife um, clearly shows her displeasure with Bub's behavior and the things that he does and the things that he says. Uh, for instance, when Bub gives, you know, the ri ridiculous little <clears throat> prayer at dinner, uh, when Bub asks Robert about what side of the train he sits on, uh, when Bub uh, pulls out the marijuana, you know, after dinner, the wife doesn't like any of that. And, you know, Bub, I think, knows it. Uh, Bub is not openly hostile to his wife, but I think it's safe to say that Bub, you know, knows that he does things that irritate his wife. And whether he's doing these on purpose or not, I suppose, is, is up for debate. Um, there's definitely some conflict between the two. I wouldn't call it the central conflict, the main conflict of the story, but it's definitely there. Uh, Robert, is he an antagonist to Bub? Well, maybe. Robert doesn't seem to be hostile to Bub. Uh, Bub, again, is not openly hostile to Robert. Bub isn't openly hostile to anybody. You know, he's just, he's a lazy slacker is what he is. Uh, but of course, we know that uh, Bub is, I think, jealous of Robert. Um, Bub may not admit that, but I think that's clear uh, to us as readers. Uh, Bub certainly has some, you know, outdated stereotypical notions of blind people, and he's sort of lumping Robert in with this stereotyped group. Um, and that's, you know, a hostile act, I think. So there is some animosity there. <clears throat> uh, so yeah, I mean, I think it's safe to say that Robert is a kind of antagonist. It may not be a two-way street in that, <clears throat> in the same way that uh, Bub and his wife are sort of uh, in conflict with each other. Um, but yeah, I think it would be okay to say that, that Robert is an antagonist. But again, the conflict between Bub and Robert, such as it is, I would not call the central conflict. And we'll talk about conflict in another that other presentation I mentioned earlier. Uh, in the story of an hour, you know, uh, Louise Mallard, of course, is the main character. Um, the secondary characters are who? They're Josephine, the sister, uh, Brentley, who breaks the news. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Richards breaks the news. Brentley is the husband, that's right. Um, 
and of course it's such a very short story things happen very quickly um, you know we, we of course learn that Louise has conflicted feelings about her husband is he an antagonist well I don't know maybe that's all backstory in a sense you know Brentley is really only in the story at the end <clears throat> um, we don't really see them in conflict with each other per se so I guess it's sort of a open-ended we, we would you know maybe we could argue that he's an antagonist I think we could also argue that he that there, that there really is no antagonist in terms of a character in the story of an hour there's another type of secondary character that we tend to encounter known as a foil uh, uh, the foil could be the antagonist if there is an antagonist it could be some other type of secondary character a foil works to characterize and develop our understanding of the protagonist the main character and a foil can do this in many ways uh, a foil can serve as a contrast to the protagonist uh, the foil can be sort of a mirror image or uh, very similar to the protagonist uh, like I say the foil could be the antagonist um, the word foil comes to us from the theater but before that um, it's really sort of a, a metaphor uh, uh, people who used to sell jewelry and, and gemstones would oftentimes put a metallic foil behind these stones to accentuate their luster and accentuate their brightness and their beauty so that's sort of metaphorically what a foil can do in a in a in a story a short story a narrative of some kind um, it doesn't always you know make a foil doesn't always make the main character beautiful or more desirable or you know more incredible looking um, a foil can make you know a protest look quite the opposite um, in cathedral uh, certainly Robert I think is a foil to Bub um, again you know we, we we hear all of these things in Bub's mind about Robert and what he thinks about Robert and, and what he thinks about blind people and Robert um, you know breaks many of those stereotypes if not all of those stereotypes I mean Robert is is just this individual who's in Bub's house and Bub is now sort of having to deal with the fact that here is this blind man in his house who happens to have a, a prior friendship with his wife um, and Bub is dealing with this one-on-one -on -one, and the way Robert acts and reacts um, sort of accentuates and, and helps the reader understand Bub a little bit more so I think Robert is a really excellent example of a foil in some of the stories that we've read so far there may not be a foil in a story uh, just because there are secondary characters doesn't necessarily mean that a secondary character is going to work as a foil and I think there are certainly some cases where it might be you know sort of open-ended and open to interpretation whether a, a secondary character is working as a foil for the main character let's talk briefly about archetypes uh, archetype is a term uh, a concept that comes to us from psychology uh, it comes to us from uh, Jungian psychology in particular uh, it comes down to us from the study of mythology um, of course mytho myth mythology is just a you know very old <laughs> sort of a culturally fundamental form of, of narrative an archetype is a, a character model or a blueprint of a character um, and so and as such it's you know sort of a very general broad type of character uh, and these archetypes if especially when we study things like mythology uh, tend to appear in stories across cultures they tend to share certain similarities with each other across time and across cultures so two of the most common 
you know, archetypes we have in stories are the hero and the villain. Uh, heroes and villains um, don't necessarily correspond with protagonist and antagonist. It really just depends on the story. Uh, heroes and villains are, you know, very common in myth. Uh, they're very common in Hollywood, <laughs> you know, blockbuster action movies. Um, but they're not necessarily so common in literary fiction. So I would, I would warn you against referring to the protagonist of, you know, one of these stories that we're reading as a hero or an antagonist, if there is one, as a villain, right? A villain, you know, think about heroes and villains from, you know, movies that you enjoy. You know, I, I'm thinking about, you know, this recent trend of superhero movies that, that's been really popular over the past, you know, decade or so. You know, you've got these heroes who do good, right? And maybe there's some sort of flaw within them. You have these villains who just seem to be bent on doing evil. And maybe there's some sort of backstory in there that makes them a little sympathetic. But ultimately, the villain, you know, chooses to do evil. And they're pretty, you know, pretty flat characters by and large. They're interesting and they have their own quirks and whatnot, but, you know, ultimately they fit into these, you know, fairly standard archetypes. In literary fiction, I think writers are more interested in exploring the nuances of human nature. And I think you'll find that um, in the characters that we're, you know, reading uh, about so far, the stories that we've been reading so far, you know, these characters have admirable traits, but they also have traits that make them less than admirable. Um, you know, Louise Mallard, I think, has got some very fascinating traits and motivations. Uh, but I think, you know, she's not all that either. Um, Paul, in Paul's case, you know, there's many things about him that I admire his sort of anti-authoritarianism, uh, the fact that he's trying to be sort of an individual. I think those are traits that most of us probably admire. Uh, but there are things about him that, you know, aren't so admirable. Uh, the same is true for characters in Sonny's Blues. So, you know, characters in, I think, literary fiction tend to be more, like I say, nuanced. They're not templates. They're not blueprints. But it is interesting to look at characters and consider how they maybe began as archetypes or blueprints and how the writer has uh, sort of developed them in the story. So again, archetypes, uh, we really talk about these when we investigate mythology and folklore, uh, Jungian psychology. These are some concepts you might deal with in an A paper if you're so inclined. Uh, and if you haven't checked this site out yet, I would I urge you to check out tvtropes.org. A trope is sort of like a stereotype. Uh, it's a recurring character or plot or image or something that we tend to see repeated across different types of stories. Uh, in Cathedral, Bub, you know, sort of fits the archetype of what I'll call the self-medicated slacker, right? He's just kind of a lazy, guy he, he, he does as much work as he needs to do in order to get by uh, he doesn't seem to you know expend a lot of energy making friends or working on his relationships or bettering himself um, and of course he you know he seems to be an alcoholic and he smokes a lot of weed um, his wife is sort of that stereotypical you know unhappy wife who nevertheless puts up with the husband and puts up with the domestic life that she's in. Uh, Robert um, is, a, I think, a very interesting character. Um, he is, I think, an archetype. He, there are, there are uh, lots, of, uh, lots of examples of this throughout myths uh, across cultures. We have the individual who is physically blind and yet is endowed with a deeper wisdom, uh, a deeper insight, and is able to um, assist other characters to see, 
And I think Robert is definitely playing that role in Cathedral. And I think Carver definitely had that in mind as he was writing the story. Okay, so <clears throat> let's get down to it. Here, so, so far, you know, characterization, protagonist, antagonist, foil, uh, archetype, these are, these are terms, concepts that you're certainly uh, welcome to use uh, in paper two. Certainly you want to use the term protagonist because you, you'll be required to identify the protagonist in paper two. But now let's talk about more specific ways that we can define uh, characters. And these are terms that you will definitely need to use in, in paper two. So we can look at a character and determine uh, after reading a story whether or not that character is round or flat round or flat. A character can't be both. A character is either going to be round or flat. So a round character is a character who has depth, a character who has dimension. Um, round characters have more than one side to their personalities. Uh, round characters oftentimes have competing or juxtaposing character traits. Uh, round characters may have complicated backstories that are really important to understand uh, in the story. Um, round characters tend to be interesting. That doesn't mean that they're necessarily likable. They might be unlikable characters, uh, but they have a depth to them. Now, of course, you know, all real human beings are round. We all have complicated personalities. We all have complicated backstories in our own unique ways. But when we're looking at a short story, you know, there's only so much room. So it's not like every character is a fully fleshed out, you know, fully developed human being. Of course, we can't really recreate that on the page. Certainly not in a short story, right? So characters are going to be round. Of course, we're not going to see everything about them and certainly some characters won't be round. It's important to know that a character's roundness is usually going to be determined early in the story. And I'm talking early, like the first paragraph, the first few paragraphs, the first few pages of a story. We're going to see evidence of roundness early in a story. We, we, we don't come to the end of story and suddenly say, oh, the character's round. I just discovered that. We're going to find evidence of that early in a story. For instance, in Cathedral, uh, Bub is the narrator. He spends, you know, several pages uh, describing the backstory of his wife and describing the, a little bit of backstory about Robert as well, you know, Robert and, and his wife. Um, at first glance, and that takes up quite a few paragraphs, right? At first glance, it may seem that Bub is kind of flat. I mean, all he's doing is telling us about these other people. We don't really see much of Bub's personality. But I would argue that the fact that Bub doesn't talk about himself is kind of intentional on his part. And that's really true for a lot of the story. He doesn't really tell us a lot about himself. He kind of keeps himself, he, he's reserved. He doesn't open up to us about himself, okay? He's, you know, happy to, to tell us about the wife and the backstory of the wife. He's happy to give us his thoughts about Robert and blind people in general, but he doesn't really talk about himself. So that omission I think is very telling. It, it's telling us that that Bub maybe is not really in touch with himself. He isn't really able to tell us much about himself because he isn't very self-aware. He, he, he's not a very contemplative person. At the same time, he does admit to us that, you know, most of what he knows about blind people he learned from TV, okay, which is just a ridiculous thing to say. And my sense is that he knows it's kind of ridiculous. So I, I, maybe I'm giving Bub more of the benefit of the doubt than I should, but I tend to think that <clears throat> Bub uh, sort of, even though he's not terribly 
self-contemplative. I think he knows enough about himself to know that he is sort of a loser. <laughs> that he, he is sort of this this slub, right? And I think the the fact that Robert calls him Bub is also very telling, right? Bub, schlub, very similar. Uh, as that story uh, progresses, and you know Robert shows up to the house, we begin to see a little bit more of Bub's character come out. And of course, Bub starts talking to Robert a little bit about himself. And I think that just accentuates his his roundness. In uh, the story of an hour, again, so such a short story, but you know, we learn on in the first sentence that Louise has a heart trouble. And of course, that becomes a theme in the story, takes on multiple dimensions in the story. Uh, a little bit later on, uh, we learn, and I'm paraphrasing here, we learn that Louise was is young and she has a fair face, uh, yet it, she looks like she's gone through some tough times. And we don't necessarily know what those tough times are. We get a little bit of a better idea about that a few drafts later. That's not much to go on, but I think it's enough for that short of a story to pin uh, Louise Mallard as being a round character. So a rule of thumb here really is that protagonists are, are usually going to be round. I mean, if, 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 if we want forward momentum in a story, if we want tension, if we want to, if we want to get interested in a character, and what a character is dealing with and the journeys that a character is taking and the conflict and all that kind of stuff. I think it, it follows that we want to have an interesting character. And that means we need a character that's not just a one note character. Now, I call this a rule of thumb because it's not an absolute rule. There are stories out there in which the protagonist is not round. And the writer is doing that very intentionally for some reason. And those can be very interesting stories. But by and large, most protagonists are going to be round. Now, in paper two, you know, feel free to, to think about this rule of thumb. But of course, in paper two, you can't just say, well, the main character, the protagonist is round. You need to show me. Give me examples from early in the story. Where do you see evidence of roundness? And you, it's not enough just to quote that or paraphrase that or summarize that for me, you've got to do that and then explain to me how do how does that quote, how, how does that plot point, how does that bit of the story that you just summarized for me, how does that show roundness in the character? So a flat character is going to be the opposite of a round character. A flat character has little or no depth. A flat character has you know one side to its personality that it really displays in the story. Secondary characters are oftentimes flat because they are not the center of the story. They are not the focus of the story. But of course, this is a rule of thumb. Secondary characters can also be round. And I think Cathedral is an excellent example of this. You know, the wife, one of the things that fascinates me about Cathedral is how we learn so much interesting stuff about the wife in the opening paragraphs. And, and then we, you know, get confirmation that the wife is really not happy with her husband, is excited to have Robert visit, is excited, you know, that Robert is there, they're friends. Um, but as the story progresses, the wife sort of recedes into the background and really stops playing a terribly important role in the story. It's like her, her, her role is now done. She was the whole reason why Robert came to the, to the house to begin with. Uh, she, you know, goes upstairs, she falls asleep, you know, and it's really the, the Bub and Robert show for, for the, the second half of the story. And I, I think that's just terribly interesting. The wife is a secondary character, but even though she seems kind of flat toward the end of the story, I think she's actually a round character. I mean, she's got a complicated backstory uh, and we can only 
guess at how that backstory and, and you know her suicide attempt and her first marriage and all of these things that happened to her you know are sort of motivating and affecting her as the story plays out robert also seems to me to be uh, a round character um you know he he has this interesting backstory as well it may not be quite as fleshed out as the wife's but of course the wife's backstory and robert's backstory are both intertwined but i think they're both round characters in the story of an hour um the only round character i think is louise now the main character all the other characters are flat you know they they serve their function they show sort of one side to their personality and then you know the story's over so the story is really not long enough to develop any of those characters in any way and um those are i think excellent examples of, of flat characters okay so your first set of sort of definition terms are round and flat again a character can't be both you want to choose which one a character is and assert that in paper two and defend it with textual evidence and explanation. The next thing you want to determine is, well, is the character dynamic or static? Again, the character can't be both. It's going to be one or the other. A dynamic character is a character that experiences meaningful change over the course of the story. Critical, meaningful change. In other words, that character is fundamentally different at the end of the story than at the beginning of the story. Something has happened that involves the plot, the conflicts, other characters maybe. Things have happened to this, this character that have caused the character to change in a meaningful and important way. And it's a, it's a way that the story is highlighting. Okay, when, when we see a character experience this change, we are looking at what we call a dynamic character. All right, so a short story, you know, like I said before, centers itself around a protagonist and the struggles that the protagonist has with a conflict or conflicts, more than one conflict. If that character changes as a result of this struggle, that doesn't necessarily mean that the conflict is resolved. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. If the character changes as a result of the things that happen to the character, the conflicts that the character faces, this character is dynamic. So a just, we said earlier that we can determine whether a character is round, sort of multifaceted, multidimensional early in a story. We usually don't see dynamic until the end we can't tell whether a character changes in a, in a pivotal important way until late in the story and in a short story that is usually going to be tied to the story's climax and the concept of epiphany so very quickly epiphany what is epiphany you may have heard this word before epiphany uh, originally is a religious word it's a spiritual word uh, that comes to us from the Christian faith. Epiphany is a feast day in the Christian calendar. Uh, the word epiphany means essentially communion with the divine, where uh, human beings in some manner commune with a higher power and come into some spiritual understanding. Well, <clears throat> James Joyce, who we'll be reading a little bit later, uh, sort of took this term epiphany. He was raised in a uh, strict religious, uh, had a sort of a strict religious upbringing that he rebelled against. Um, he took this word epiphany and sort of brought it down to earth and applied it to the change that characters can undergo in fiction. So when a character comes into a, an important understanding at the end of a story, um, you know, maybe it's, an un it's usually an understanding about the self. It's usually an understanding about one's own nature. Uh, it could be an understanding about, you know, one's relationships with others. It could be an understanding about the way the world works. It could be any of these. But when that character experiences this, and 
sometimes it's a sudden epiphany. Um, but even if that's the case, we can usually backtrack and see the steps that have led up to this. Uh, when a character has that epiphany at the end of a story, that's usually going to be the climax of the story as well. <clears throat> and it's what the, the, the story has been leading up to. And it's oftentimes a result of, you know, the character's roundedness being um, tested and manipulated and it going through evolution and change over the story. So um, in Cathedral, we have, I think, a very clear example of this. And I, I think it's it's fantastic that that, you know, the name of the story is Cathedral and and that Robert and Bub are dr trying to draw a cathedral. Right. The whole point of the cathedral was to um, raise itself up high in order to reach God, in order to commune with God. And not to say that Bub has a spiritual epiphany at the end or an understanding, but he certainly goes through an experience where um, his his uh, you know biases are ch challenged and broken down. And sort of the wall that he's built around himself crumbles at least a little bit. And he has this just this amazing, very intimate personal experience at the end uh, that makes him see things in a new way. And it's, of course, ironic that um, he, he's he's uh, he's closing his eyes. Right. Robert being blind has the greater understanding that he sort of imparts to Bub there at the end uh, in the story of an hour. Um, very obvious example of an epiphany. You know, the narrator talks about Louise having this exalted perception. Uh, you know, the, the, Chopin doesn't use the word epiphany, but she may as well have. She's referring to exactly what an epiphany is. This very sudden, very intense, um, almost overwhelming experience of self-revelation. So those are two examples of dynamic characters, Bub and Louise Mallard. They're both dynamic. They both go through these changes over the course of the story, but especially we see confirmation of that change in the climactic moments. Um, the climax of, of Cathedral occurs at the very end. The climax of the story of an hour, even though it's a shorter story, of course, is a little more complicated. Uh, Louise has her epiphany and then walks down the stairs like Victory, the goddess of Victory, who's this, you know, tall, strong, proud looking goddess with wings. And then, of course, what happens at the end when Brentley shows up and Louise, I'm sorry, I'm laughing. It's not funny, right? <clears throat> but Louise dies uh, because her entire future that she has imagined is now crumbled right before her feet. Um, that's the climax of the story, of course. So again, rule of thumb, most protagonists are going to be dynamic. That's not universally true, but it is oftentimes true. Finally, static <clears throat> static characters don't show meaningful change over the course of a story. Right? They, they may be round. They might be interesting. They might be multidimensional in terms of their natures and personalities. But ultimately, they do not go through a substantial, critical, meaningful change by the story's end. And again, there are stories that are like that. Um, when we when we see a story like that, we just have to ask ourselves, well, you know, why is that? There's got there's probably some reason why that character didn't come into an understanding or didn't change. Um, and that that's probably critical to the story's central idea in some way. Most secondary characters are going to be static. Um, they are not the focus of the story. The focus of the story is on the protagonist, not the secondary characters. So a lot of times you're going to see secondary characters that really do not change. Again, that is a rule of thumb. It is not a universal law. Um, Robert, for instance, I think, you know, goes he goes through changes in the story. I wouldn't say he comes to some final earth shaking change about himself or anything. He's not the main character, but you know, he tries marijuana for the first time. You know, he's an older guy, but he tries it for the first time. He's he's open to new experiences. So he changes a little bit as a result of interacting with Bub 
I think that's safe to say. Um, you know, in the story of an hour, did Josephine change? Did uh, uh, Brentley change upon seeing his wife die at his feet? Well, I'm sure they probably did, but the story doesn't tackle any of that. The story ends. So we can't extrapolate beyond the confines of the story. We have to deal with what we're given in the story as we're making these sort of determinations. So generally speaking, a round character is going to become, by the story and the story's end, also a dynamic character. A flat character at the beginning of a story is probably going to remain, you know, flat, of course, and therefore static by the story's end. That's a rule of thumb. There are stories out there where we have round characters that remain static throughout. They don't ultimately go through a dynamic shift in their natures. Um, we have, uh, I suppose it's possible to have a flat character that does change in some way. I can't, I honestly can't think of an example, but I'm sure there's a story out there that's like that. Generally speaking, round characters become dynamic characters, flat characters just sort of remain their old flat selves and therefore are static characters. So I hope this presentation uh, helps you understand a bit more about these terms. Uh, you'll be using these terms in paper too, like I say. Uh, please do not make the mistake of saying that a character is both round and flat. That is not true. That cannot be true. Um, even if a character seems flat early on and then you see evidence of roundness after the third page, we will call that character round, not flat. Uh, a character cannot be flat and round at the same time, just like a character cannot be dynamic and static at the same time. So please make sure that you understand the relationship between these two pairs of words, round and dynamic, flat and static. I should say round or dynamic and flat or static and use those terms as you see fit uh, in paper two. Paper two, you're only focusing on the main character, although you may find that you have to write about secondary characters, especially when you come to the conflict portion of the essay. Next up, uh, in the next presentation, we'll focus on conflict and talk a little bit about that and the terms that you'll need to uh, use in order to write about conflict.